I sold it for $400,000, so when going on a trip abroad with my mistress. John's voice was inappropriately cheerful, making me blurt out, what? He called me while he was in the hospital. He sold the house for $400,000, what does that mean? That was a cherished home I inherited from my dad. And to openly declare he has a mistress, that's just insane. What do you mean you sold the house? What about Lisa? As soon as I mentioned her daughter, John snorted with laughter. I've always found her annoying. She acts so disrespectful towards adults. Of course, I'm leaving her behind. What a thing to say about his own daughter. I was filled with rage and shock at the news of him selling the house and running away with his mistress. My mind was reeling. I have to stop John. Even if he says he sold the house, it can't be handed over that quickly. I have to do something. My name is Emily, a 39-year-old housewife. I wish I could say I live a content life with my husband, John, a year older than me, and our nine-year-old daughter, Lisa, but our relationship is far from harmonious. Since our marriage, John's personality has gradually twisted, and I suspect he has been cheating for a year now. Without proof, I've been helpless, but John hasn't been very secretive about his affair. John, who works in a factory, heads out to drink somewhere four or five days a week after work. It might be with co-workers, but he didn't used to go out as much until a year ago. Moreover, he comes home with a distinctive perfume scent and has been preparing expensive bags and shoes I've never seen before. Of course, they're not for me, but for someone else, as he leaves with these gifts time and again. I've been too scared to confront him about his cheating, remaining timid and unable to act until I can gather proof. He's like a completely different person from the one I met. John and I met 10 years ago, got married after a year of dating. Drawn in by his kind and gentlemanly demeanor, and before I knew it, I was in love. He proposed on our first anniversary, and soon after, Lisa was born. It looked like a very happy marriage from the outside. Why did things turn out this way? The troubles began when Lisa turned one. She became more active and curious about everything in the house, making childcare increasingly difficult. I was a full-time housewife and took care of Lisa all day, but sometimes I needed help from John when he finished work with bathing and meals. John helped with childcare at first because he was aware of being a father, but as it continued every day, he gradually became disgusted and stopped trying to get involved in childcare. I've been thinking, isn't this your job? You're the full-time housewife, so you should be able to handle the childcare on your own. Why does a tired man like me have to help out? Exploding with frustration, John spat out these harsh words and quickly retreated to his bedroom, leaving Lisa and me in the living room. I was deeply hurt by his words as I tried to calm down Lisa, who was going through her tantrum phase and crying about wearing her pajamas. After that, John completely stopped interacting with Lisa. Even when she asked him to play on his days off, saying, Daddy, let's play, he would reply, busy reading his racing magazine, playing his mom's job, I'm busy right now. He never really listened to Lisa's feelings. Lisa cried, no. Hey, don't cry over something like this. What kind of upbringing is Emily giving you? A full-time housewife who can't even handle child care, how incompetent. He would say, glaring at Lisa and me in turn. I didn't want Lisa to hear such harsh words from John, so we had to go back to our room and play together. Even I want to read and watch movies. But living closely with Lisa means I hardly have time for myself. Yet John enjoys his hobby, horse racing, while I have to endure his verbal abuse. It's just not fair. 
but since our household depends on John's income, I couldn't complain. Without him, I wouldn't be able to provide for Lisa on my own. I was frustrated with myself. So, John has been disinterested in parenting, living as he pleases. Eight years have passed, and Lisa is now nine years old. John's harsh words never ceased, and the kind John from before is nowhere to be seen. I've been living with him solely for Lisa's sake, try my best not to upset him. Mom, you're good at drawing. You should do it as a job. One day, while drawing with Lisa, she suddenly said this. Really? A job in drawing? I think your drawings are gentle and really beautiful. Lisa laughed cheerfully at the animal illustrations I had drawn. I've always enjoyed drawing, and there was a time when I even aimed to be a cartoonist. Realizing midway that the path to becoming a cartoonist was too tough, I gave up, but I still drew illustrations as a hobby. Lisa, I always show your drawings to my friends, Ashley and Samantha, and brag about them. They both say they're amazing and wish they had a mom who could draw like that. Despite her father, John, being difficult, Lisa has grown up to be honest and straightforward. Her personality is bright and the total opposite of my more introverted nature. She seems to have many friends at school and is favored by her teacher. I felt so proud that Lisa appreciated my drawings. Thinking that Lisa notices me boosted my confidence. Thank you, that means a lot to me. When I said that, Lisa smiled like a blooming flower again. Seeing Lisa smile makes me think I can keep enduring this life. I thought this quietly to myself. That night, John, as usual, came home drunk, collapsing in the living room right after entering. He was drunk. His drinking had become frequent, worryingly so. I sighed and pulled his jacket off the slumped over John, checking his pockets. What's this? Normally finding nothing but keys in his pocket, this time a piece of paper caught my attention. It was a receipt with a hotel name on it, clearly visible. This is definite proof of his cheating. I had been suspecting infidelity, but now I had physical evidence. Trying to calm my uneasy heart, I carefully stashed the receipt on a shelf. Then I started to think about how to confront John, the next day, still partly drunk, John left the house. After Lisa went to school, I was doing household chores as usual, but I couldn't stop thinking about yesterday's receipt. I had a hunch John was cheating, and it was my choice not to confront him about it. But now with concrete evidence, it's hard to continue pretending and live as a married couple in name only. Within a week, no, in a few days, I want to make him admit his infidelity and get an apology. But how should I do it? As I was pondering this, my phone started to vibrate. Who could it be at this time? It was unusual to get a call during the day. Looking at my phone, I saw an unfamiliar number. With a sense of foreboding, I answered the call. Hello, is this Mrs. Murphy? Yes, that's me, but who is this? This is from State General Hospital. I'm afraid John has been brought in by ambulance. The call was from the biggest hospital in the area. The hospital staff explained that John had been brought in for emergency surgery due to a kidney issue and that he would likely need a transplant as his condition was severe. Confused by the sudden news, I was asked by the doctor, are you all right? Yes, can he do that kidney transplant? Yes, we'll start looking for a donor immediately if we find a match. Okay. Then we can proceed with the transplant surgery. Suddenly hearing that John was sick and needed a kidney transplant, my mind was in turmoil, but the doctor continued to explain the transplant procedure. We'll start checking for compatibility with potential donors. So please cooperate with this. I only understood half of what the doctor said, 
But it was clear John was in a serious condition. Despite his mistreatment and infidelity, I didn't wish for him to lose his life. I wanted him to survive if possible. I spent that night thinking about John's transplant surgery. After a few weeks, we found out the results for potential kidney donors, mostly family. To my surprise, I was the best match. John's parents were still alive but in poor health, unable to undergo surgery. As an only child and being in good health and blood type compatible, it turned out I was the best option for John. I'd be lying if I said I didn't hesitate. But I couldn't compare that to John's life. With that in mind, I decided to become John's kidney donor. When I explained to Lisa about John's condition and the transplant, she cheerfully said, got it, take care and do your best. While I was hospitalized, Lisa would stay with her grandparents. Though they were in poor health, they were mostly able to manage at home. Lisa was happy to stay with her grandparents as she got along well with them. At least I can be at ease for a while. It's good that Lisa is such an understanding child. Relieved, I went ahead with the transplant surgery. A week later, after signing the consent forms and undergoing health checks, I underwent the kidney transplant for John. The surgery was surprisingly straightforward and I was in the hospital for about a week while John stayed for about 10 days. Fortunately, there were no major health issues and the recovery was smooth. The day before I was discharged, my phone rang again. Wondering who it could be this time, I answered. Hello, it's me. I heard a familiar voice and felt a shiver. It was John himself. Thinking he might thank me for being a donor, I asked. Long time no see. How are you feeling post-surgery? I expected him to say something like, Thanks, Emily, I'm feeling better. But what I heard next was unexpected. I'd like to talk about our house. John paused, suddenly bringing up the house. And I was taken aback. I sold it for $400,000, so when going on a trip abroad with my mistress. John's voice was inappropriately cheerful, making me blurt out, what? He called during his hospital stay to say he sold the house for $400,000. What does that mean? That was a cherished home I inherited from my father. And to openly declare he has a mistress, that's just insane. What do you mean you sold the house? What about Lisa? As soon as I mentioned her daughter, John snorted with laughter. I've always found her annoying. She acts so disrespectful towards adults. Of course, I'm leaving her behind. What a thing to say about his own daughter. I was filled with rage and shock at the news of him selling the house and running away with his mistress. My mind was reeling. I have to stop John. Even if he says he sold the house, it can't be handed over that quickly. I have to do something. John had already hung up the phone after saying going on a trip with his mistress. I was trying to make sense of what had happened with my confused mind. But no matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't believe he would sell our house, especially during his hospital stay. Shocked, my condition worsened, and my hospital stay was extended by a few days. Feeling utterly defeated, I lay on my bed helplessly thinking about the future. I should call Lisa first. Without the house, Lisa and I would have nowhere to go. The bold declaration of having a mistress was infuriating, but what concerned me most was Lisa. I called the home of John's parents, and his mother answered. She quickly put Lisa on the phone. Hello, Lisa, I'm sorry. It looks like my hospital stay is going to be longer. Are you okay? Not too lonely. I heard about your dad selling the house. We don't have a place to go back to now. I rapidly asked, worried about Lisa. Then Lisa answered with a bright voice. Mom, it's okay. I've taken care of it. What? I was puzzled by Lisa's words about having taken care of it. 
Dad told me he asked his mistress to sell the house. But actually, Grandma and Grandpa. Lisa detailed the events that had occurred during my hospital stay. I was stunned. As unexpected developments had unfolded without my knowledge. So, Mom, just dressed easy. I'm okay. Thank you. Lisa's responsible words encouraged me, and I finally managed to calm down a bit. However, if what Lisa was saying was true, I wondered what was happening with John and his mistress now. Curious, but reminding myself that rest was crucial, I fell asleep. Three days later, fully recovered, I headed to my in-law's house. Mom, welcome back. Lisa ran up to me with a happy face, with Grandma smiling softly behind her. Speaking of which, John really did something outrageous. I'm sorry, Emily. My father-in-law apologized to me with a stern face. With such wonderful parents, why did John turn out this way? No, it's my fault for going along with everything without saying anything. Thank you. Now, there's something we need to tell you, Emily. Yes, what is it? I sat down with Lisa to listen to my in-law story. Though surprised again, mother-in-law's assertive encouragement that they wouldn't let John have his way gave me some relief. After hearing the story from my in-laws, Lisi and I were about to head home when I noticed a familiar man and an unfamiliar woman having a dispute in front of a real estate office. It was unmistakably John. And the woman with him had to be his mistress. John was in sweats, his hair a mess, and his mistress was in a short skirt and one high heel, barefaced. Hey, fix this. How come the house isn't selling? What about my $400,000? Well, the buyer cancelled last night, so there's no deal anymore. Why the cancellation? Damn it. John was stomping his feet, and his mistress was shrieking beside him, drawing startled looks from passersby. Lisa and I were shocked but realized it was about us, and we approached John and his mistress. What are you doing here? Startled by my sudden approach, John and his mistress exclaimed in surprise. Oh, it's you. I get it. You did this, didn't you? You convinced the buyer not to go through with it. That's ridiculous. What are you even talking about? As John and his mistress hurled insults, I shielded Lisa behind me. The real estate agent was bewildered, so I stepped forward and said, I'm his wife. The agent responded with a stunned oh. Are you kidding me with this cancellation? Because of you, we had to turn back right before getting on the plane, and now we can't buy a new house. And there's the debt I incurred for her. John pointed at his mistress when he mentioned her. So, that's it. Now I understand John's scheme. He tried to sell the house to pay the debt of the money he had spent on his mistress, and to buy a new house to live in with her. How selfish of him to know that this is a precious house that I inherited from my late father. He was ignoring me and Lisa and trying to steal my most important asset. I was trembling with anger. Don't you think you're the one being disrespectful here? Showing up out of nowhere and talking back to me. You can't even eat properly without me. I continued my words disgusted by John who was abusing me. First off, do you really think you can sell my cherished home without consulting me? I'm the owner of that house. Did you forge some documents or what? And you've been bad-mouthing the buyer, but you should know the buyers were your parents. What? What's going on? Indeed, during my hospital stay, I learned from Lisa over the phone that my in-laws pretended to buy the house to teach John a lesson. They were furious after hearing about John's misdeeds from Lisa, saying, it's unbelievable what he has done to Emily and our dear granddaughter. My in-laws believed Lisa's words over their sins due to her cheerful and honest nature. I'll explain. 
Grandpa and Grandma knew about Dad and his mistress and were very angry. I knew Dad was trying to sell the house and consulted with them. The house is an important one that my mom inherited, and they said it shouldn't be sold so easily. So, they tried to buy it themselves before anyone else could. Lisa confidently stepped forward to narrate the events. What the hell are they doing to their own son? Damn old man and woman. And you too, ye child meddling in adult affairs shows what poo parenting you've had. John, losing his composure, scoffed. Lisa remained composed against John's outburst. I pulled out a document from my bag, thrusting it in front of his nose. Sorry, but we're getting a divorce? Seeing the divorce papers, John snorted again. Divorce? You said it. You think you can live without me? He must have thought that as a stay-at-home mom, I'd be lost without him. Perhaps that was true before. But now, I have a trump card. I spoke up to shatter John's shallow thinking. No need to worry. Your parents have decided to give me a pre-death gift. Pre-death gift? What's that? John and his mistress were bewildered. Indeed, this morning, my in-laws told me about a pre-death gift. Before it was too late, as their health was failing. They wanted to give me a part of their assets. I initially refused, thinking the gift should go to John. However, they insisted, we care more about Emily, who gave birth to and raised our wonderful granddaughter, than our son who can't even thank you for the organ donation. I agreed to the pre-death gift from them. It's your parents' wish. They wanted to give it to me, not you. I told John, whose face turned pale. That's probably true. He was shocked to lose the assets that should have been his to his soon-to-be ex-wife. That's dirty. That's not right. It's normal for children to inherit their parents' assets. I'll talk to them. If they don't listen, I'll sue. John glared at me with fiery eyes, shouting. I sighed at his shallow thinking. Maybe it's time to end this. Stepping forward, I met John's gaze and declared, What you're saying is absurd. You ridiculed me and even got a mistress, didn't you? It's your fault for spending the money, right? Your parents made the right decision. And do you even have the money for a lawsuit? How will your past betrayals look in court? John let out a shriek, visibly shaken by my assertive presence. Sorry, I won't sue. Please forgive me. He begged desperately, but it was too late. I glared at John one last time and stated firmly, you will pay the alimony and child support for insulting Liso and me. If you can't pay, I'll pursue it to the ends of the earth. Be prepared. John and his mistress screamed and ran away. The real estate agent, having witnessed everything, thanked me with a wobbly stance. Thank you so much. No, I'm really sorry for causing such trouble. Feeling awkward, I took Lisa's hand and we went back home. Mom, you were awesome. And so were you, Lisa. Thank you for standing up for me. Despite the situation, Lisa's face was smiling. I vowed in my heart to protect her for life. A few days later, I was able to successfully divorce John. The long-endured marriage ended with just a piece of paper, making me wonder why I had put up with it for so long. John had really squandered his money on his mistress and ended up borrowing to pay the alimony. The mistress left him, saying, I can't stay with such a poor man. Adding to his misfortune, John's company had to reduce staff due to decreased sales from material shortages. Working in the factory, John was one of the first to be laid off. It's sad, but it's hard to believe there was no reason for his dismissal. Probably, the company let go of those who were performing poorly or had bad behavior first. John, who used to boss around at home, must have had the same attitude at work. 
Now jobless, loverless, and wifeless, John is scraping by with odd jobs. His days must be bleak, devoting himself to part-time work that allows him to rest whenever he likes, lacking the energy to seek proper employment. But I felt no sympathy for him. I had done all I could by donating part of my kidney to him. It seemed like karma for how he belittled me. He should just work hard to pay off his debts. As for me, I started making a living with the assets inherited from my in-laws and began working as an illustrator. It all started when Lisa complimented me on how good I was at drawing. While the orders are still few, my clients say my work is meticulous and skilled. I plan to increase my clientele and raise Lisa proudly.